Hey, don't want to wait so long in between main channel meatball content? Well, check out some links in the description because these thumbnails on screen are other videos you probably missed. How's it going, everybody? Chaotic Meatball here, and welcome back to the channel. So today we're jumping into one of the mainline games I really don't give too much attention, but I figured it's about time I try changing that by doing a hardcore nuzlocke of Ultra Sun and Moon using only poison types. The rules are simple and in the description if you want a quick rundown, but before we get into the run, make sure to poison jab that like button. <laughs> I'm sorry, the joke was right in front of me. Let's aim for 3,000 likes on this video and subscribe if you haven't already. Last but not least, follow me on Twitter. I make a lot of ha-has and other various posts about both the channel and other goings on over there. Link in the description. But with those out of the way, we've got a hefty job to do. Our available encounters are Spinarak, Alolan Grimer, Ekans, Bulbasaur, Ghastly, Zubat, Beedrill, Tentacool, Marini, Salandit, Trubbish, Dragalge, and Drapion. But sadly, that last one is exclusive to Ultra Wormholes, so we'll be stuck with Alolan Muck as our only Poison Dark type. The last problem here is that Ekans and Bulbasaur are both only available on Route 2, the former by normal means, and the latter by island scan. And thanks to the former getting Intimidate, I'm sure you know which one I'll be grabbing. This leaves me with 11 encounters to complete the entire game with, and it's not a good start when my first encounter on Route 1, that being Spinarak during the nighttime, just keeps failing to KO anything over and over again to try to get itself above level 2. The closest chance I had was trying to KO a Pichu in which Spinarak couldn't even do herself, so after a few attempt losses, I legitimately had to make an executive decision to allow myself to train Spinarak up to the level 5 starting level of starters by switch training with my starter of choice in Rowlet just so that it could KO something, seeing as I tried training on Pokemon after I captured it at level 2 and it just didn't work, like I said. Even once I got it to level 5 though, it was a struggle just to find my second encounter in Grimer over in the trainer school. After all the tutorial stuff, I got to the point where I lost another attempt just trying to capture one. Thankfully, on the second try of grabbing Grimer, I was successful, and this attempt was finally going smoothly. I was able to steamroll encounters from here, but before getting them, I want to touch on the totem stickers for just a moment. One of my encounters actually hinges on this specifically, seeing as there's a Totem Salazzle that I can obtain after grabbing 50 of these. This is basically so I can bypass the likelihood of me running into a male Salandit and having to go without Salazzle for the whole run, and 50 really shouldn't be that hard for me to get by the third island. Anyway, after beating Elima, I was given access to Route 2 where I could grab Ekans, thankfully with Intimidate, otherwise I would have reset here. There's no way I'm going through this run without Intimidate. Ghastly over in the Howley Cemetery, and Zubat in the Sandy Cave next to Big Wave Beach. Having a party of five is actually really big, especially for the first trial against the Totem Radicate, though I still did almost go over the level cap for this area thanks to the EXP share. Of course, I'm pretty much going to have this thing turned off since rare candies are a thing, especially since they're legitimately obtainable through the tedious method of Mantine surfing shortly, so we should be good. I make sure to lead off with Ekans against the Totem, though, because I want Intimidate to lower the Totem's attack, then swap into Grimer, take an attack, and use Poison Gas to hit both the Raticate and Rattata, then hit a second after running out Raticate's Pecha Berry, then swapping repeatedly to run out the Poison Clock. A second Intimidate lowers Raticate down to minus 2 attack and Raditate down to minus 1, so I swap into Zubat who takes less than half, and then I attempt Supersonic on the Totem Raticate, but I missed, so I swapped into Spinarak, also taking less than half and firing off Infestation for some super effective damage on Raticate, KOing with the additional damage between turns and leaving just the Rattata to fall into an Infestation next turn. Dang, after all that hassle Spinarak was giving me at the beginning of the run, it finally came in at a perfect opportune time to do some work. With the Normalium Z obtained though, we're not quite done yet. Route 3 may not have any encounters for me, but it does loop back around on the island, giving me easy access to Iki Town once again and the home of Melee Melee Island's Kahuna Hala. But we can't fight him just yet, we've got to take down How in our first actual battle against him, seeing as I didn't have access to any poison types during the last two fights with him. 
He leads off with a Poplio, so I'm going with Zubat, aiming to just hit Wing Attack over and over again, in which I'm able to 5-shot through his Berry, taking a Water Gun and 3 Disarming Voices before grabbing the KO, though the priority Baby Doll Eyes makes Zubat practically useless on the last turn, though I was already planning on swapping out with Pikachu entering the fray, so I'm able to go into Grimer, use Poison Gas, and hit 2 Bites for the KO, but not before getting paralyzed. Not shocking, no pun intended, thanks to Static and Thundershock, but still inconvenient. Last up is Noibat, who uses Supersonic on Grimer and makes him basically immobile, so I swap into Ekans and use Glare to paralyze, eventually KOing with a bite to win the fight. Pretty sound fight for our first rival battle, but straight after is the Kahuna himself. He's a fighting type user, and naturally that means that Ghastly's gonna be perfect. Though the funniest thing here is that the only Pokemon who can hurt Ghastly on his 3-mon team is Crabrawler and Pursuit. So by actively not switching it out and using Nightshade, I can easily sweep his team. Though his AI is actually smarter than I give it credit for. He goes into Crabrawler immediately, then I'm forced to use Hypnosis, otherwise Pursuit would have been an insta-KO eventually landing the second and giving me plenty of time to swap into Zubat and deliver two wing attacks to KO before he even gets the chance to use a Z move. With Crabrawler out of the way though, it's only a matter of time, so I bring back in Ghastly, take Maki to sand attack attempts, and swap in and out with Ekans for both Intimidate and to get that status off of me, eventually KOing both him and Machop with a few Nightshades apiece to earn me the fight in EMZ and let me head off to Akala Island. Now this island is a bit more involved compared to the last one. Instead of just one totem Pokemon, I've got a Tango with three of them. But of course, we can't get to the first one without a quick rival battle. Beforehand though, as I mentioned before, Mantine Surfing is available now that I'm able to go in between islands. This gives me access to infinite battle points, or beach points, or whatever you want to call them, and therefore easy access to EV items to reduce grinding, nearly infinite berry juice for a generically powerful held item, recovering 20 HP once taken below half, ethers to use between battles at any time and during trials, PP ups to maximize power points of moves with low points for those drawn out battles, which happens a lot thanks to the naturally slow playing poison type, rare candies so that the EXP share can be permanently turned off for this run because screw over leveling, infinite money generation because of those vitamins earlier specified, and of course, move tutors. Yeah, we're given a lot because of this stuff. I'm able to access neat moves like Fire Punch for Grimer or Bounce for Spinarak, as well as a few other neat things that should likely come up soon. Passing through Hey Hey City and Route 4 gets me to Paniola Town, the home of said rival fight. How's leading with a Breon now, which is pretty cool, but it's still not very threatening with my whole team resisting the fairy type. I lead with Ekans as to resist said fairy typing and use Intimidate for his only water move in Aqua Jet, using Glare to paralyze and taking 5 points of damage off of Disarming Voice, then swapping to Ghastly to resist and use Giga Drain for massive damage, taking a second Disarming Voice, but healing that damage off with a second Giga Drain to KO and lead into Noibat. Sure, this guy has bite, but even a critical here only does half, so I stay in to try to put him to sleep with Hypnosis for an easy switch, but it's rather pointless. I may as well just go into Grimer and KO with a single bite, leading to Pikachu who falls to a single Poison Fang, then manages to get the poison for the last bit of damage, leaving just Eevee. I swap back into Ghastly since he's got nothing for me, and Baby Doll Eyes isn't affecting a special attacker, Giga Draining twice for the KO and the win. Now, the fact that I'm given Giga Drain this early, thanks to Move Tutors, is Quite crazy, it's such a nice coverage move on Ghastly, who already has over a base 100 special attack, and our next encounter to fill out the team before facing off against Totem Araquanid also gets it in Beedrill. This is an island scan Pokemon available on Route 5 only on Fridays, but he should come in handy being a fully evolved Pokemon this early on and all. Before I can get to him though, I've got to face off against Gladian at the entrance of Route 5, and while he's all bad and brooding, he's a pretty easy boss to take down. Zerua falls to Bugbite from Spinarak, allowing me to swap in for Ekans against his Zubat, paralyzing with Glare, lowering his defense with Screech, and then using a few bites to take him out with the longevity provided by the Berry Juice, leaving just Type Null. This is also a pretty easy one to take out as well, as Glare paralyzes him and gives me the out to swap into Grimer, Using several Poison Fangs and our bulky defenses as well as another Berry Juice to stay healthy enough to solo type Null, KOing and winning the last important battle before Araquanid. 
My strategy for said Araquanid, though, was very similar to how I took out the Totem Raticate, starting off Ekans and de-incentivizing Leech Life thanks to Intimidate, causing Bubble to be the main attack of choice as I swapped into Grimer, took it, then delivered a Poison Gas to both it and the desistant Dewpiter before swapping out. Of course, Berry Juice was needed on all six of my Pokemon in order to survive here, not to mention a Sacrifice of Spinarak. I needed to get some extra damage on Araquanid since it would be left with a sliver thanks to poison, and with that priority that Shadow Sneak provides, I'm able to get that extra damage, losing Spinarak but allowing for Zubat to come in, and of course, miss the range with Wing Attack. But thanks to poison taking Araquanid out, I could stay in on 9 HP and KO Dewpiter with Wing Attack to win the battle. No, I'm not too saddened by the loss of our official starter, seeing as Ariados was never going to be doing too much for me in the grand scheme of things, especially with Beedrill taking the mantle for the better bug poison type. With the trial done though, I'm given access to capturing wild Pokemon in the Totem Slayer, meaning I can bust out that Lapras Ride pager I was just given in order to capture myself a Tentacool, as well as a Marini over in the Mele Mele Sea by SOS Battles with Corsola. These are available just in time for the next trial, since it's a Fire-type one as well. Though I suppose it's even better still since the Totem Marowak is part Ghost-type, a type that Poison also resists quite well, so it's a good combo. Beforehand though, I've got to take out the Battle Royale portion of the game, but you remember Mantine surfing from a few minutes ago, right? Yeah, the BP earned there is usable here as well, meaning I can grab myself six sets of leftovers for when Berry Juice becomes a useless item, which is fast approaching with how high of a level my Pokemon are going to become soon. I'd say give it until the end of Akala, beginning of Ula Ula Island, until these become the staple of going forward. With the level cap at 22 though, I'm able to evolve both Zubat and Ekans into Golbat and Arbok before the trial, giving me plenty of advantage over the Totem Marowak especially when the latter of those keeps Intimidate as her ability and gets Crunch upon evolution. I lead with Arbok against Marowak, who uses Detect the first turn as I use Glare to allow for Salazzle to come down onto the field to make it a 2-on-1 pretty quickly, but I'm able to use a second one to hit Marowak before Torment and Flame Burst come down, doing a bit too much damage to Arbok as I would have liked, so I swap into Grimer for some additional walling ability, then into Marini for that water typing, eventually holding Marowak down long enough to swap into Tentacool, trying to KO but getting walled by Detect Torment combo. Stupid poison type trying to stall, I'm the only one that's allowed to do that. Eventually I get pissed off enough to swap into Golbat and use Confuse Ray on Salazzle, expecting Detect, then use Bite on Marowak to finally KO it, but that leaves Golbat vulnerable to a Flame Burst that takes him down to 6 HP. So I swap back into Tentacool, finally finishing the stupid Lizard off with a Water Pulse to win. You can tell when that switch in my head goes off during these fights and I get pissed off, because I just start clicking buttons to try to end it as fast as possible since I'm both agitated and bored at the same time. But thankfully, we didn't lose any Pokemon to Marowak or Salazzle, and that's all I can ask for. And know that Salazzle doesn't count as my first kin counter of it. I couldn't capture it. And because I know some dork is going to try to point that out in the comments, I'm nipping you in the bud before you get that chance to exist. Anyway, with the Fiery MZ in hand, I'm able to head up exactly one tunnel and one route to get to the Lush Jungle, the home of the last regular trial of Akala Island, and that's against the Totem Lorantis. And you know whose level cap increased by exactly two and gave me access to Crobat because of it? Well, obviously me, but that's just my way of telling you I cross-poisoned the f*** out of Lorantis and the Assistant Comfy. As much as that little bugger wanted to keep Lorantis healthy, five power points of synthesis and the help that Comfy was providing with floral healing were never going to keep Lorantis alive for long, just delaying the inevitable when there's no moves that Crobat doesn't resist on these move sets, so why bother resisting? With those trials done though, all that's left is our grand trial against Olivia, and oddly enough, I think this is going to be rather difficult. She's a rock type user, which could be bad if there was a lot of rock types on her team that were also part ground, say Graveler, Onyx, stuff that's hybrids with Sturdy, but she doesn't. Instead, she uses the Gen 3 Fossils and Lycanroc as her ace, but I've got a bunch of flimsy mons like Tentacool and Beedrill that don't really stand up to physical attackers or rock type moves respectively, so I'm gonna have to play this very carefully to make sure I don't lose anybody. 
She leads with Anorith as I go with Tentacool, setting up Toxic Spikes as Smackdown almost KOs. Yeah, I told you this stupid thing was brittle as all get out. Probably should have set up three barriers alternating with Protects first so that I could have survived since I have now equipped all six of my Pokemon with Leftovers, though any crit would have done me in at that point and I wasn't exactly willing to risk that. I swap into Grimer here in order to put this guy down with Poison Fang, getting the Poison with Poison Touch, but but man, that Anorith just does some good damage with Bug Bite. So I swap into Crobat expecting said Bug Bite, which I do get, then using Protect and Steel Wing in order to take him down and get Lily in second. Now she's got Ancient Power, but I think I can hold her down enough with Confuse Ray and Steel Wing taking less from Ancient Power as I use Protect, but of course Lilip gets out of confusion almost immediately, so I'm just hopping straight over to Steel Wing, thankfully using two in a row expecting the Super Potion, then using Protect and one last one to KO and leave just Lycanroc. Now I'm 1000% sure she's just gonna go for the Continental Crush Z move here, so I swap into Arbok for the Intimidate drop and the best likelihood I have in KOing this guy. And my good old Tsuchinoko was dangerously close to getting KO'd here. Yu-Gi-Oh players will get that one. Anyway, I'm able to use Protect to get some more poison damage, then swap into Marini to take a Rock Tomb for less than 20 damage after Leftovers, then use Protect for more poison damage and more healing from Leftovers, taking a bite that flinches unfortunately, but then getting another Protect for poison damage doing its thing. Thankfully, just enough damage from that poison for Water Pulse to land the second go around, and allow that last bit of damage to KO and win me the fight. Yeah, that was a bit of a disaster. I really don't have a great way of taking care of rock types yet, though once Marini evolves and becomes a hulking beast of a tank, seriously, this thing has insane defenses, and Tentacool also gets that evolution shortly, I'm sure I'll be in a great position. Not like it'll matter with the next totem Pokemon being Togedemaru, but we'll have to get to Ula Ula Island to fight that problem first. With a little bit of a reprieve thanks to the Aether Paradise, but not much of one since, oh god, tentacle hentai monster that I can't use despite it being poison type. Well then, now that we're on Ula Ula Island, it's time to take on yet another rival fight. Nothing too much to worry about here, since he leads Brion, simply protect on the first turn in case he decides to use a Z-move, then go for Venishock, but of course he actually uses the Z-move on turn two. I'm not lying, these games read inputs and it's true. I've had comments that say that, oh, you're misleading your viewers by saying that the AI reads inputs, but they do! You see that bullshit? You see that f***ing stupid Hydro Vortex? <sighs> A few more turns of alternating Protect and Venishock eventually takes out Brion with my newly evolved Tentacruel having two thirds of its HP remaining, but that Alolan Raichu doesn't really care how much HP it remains, so I swap into Grimer, take a Psychic thanks to Immunity, then use Knock Off for the one-shot KO as Flareon comes in third. It does rather massive damage with Fire Fang, though I managed to poison him with Poison Fang, using Protect to let that damage add up before swapping back into Tentacruel for the resistance, using Protect and allowing for Flareon to go down, leading to Tauros. I figured that Intimidate would be my best bet here in nullifying this thing and the damage it causes, so I swap into Arbok, then into Marini to use Toxic, and just wait. Yeah, the bad thing about Poison types is that these sorts of battles end up having a lot of a lot of waiting, especially when the AI is dumb and has no idea he can switch Pokemon. I just swap over to Arbok again, use Crunch and take a Horn Attack, then Tauros falls to Toxic Damage, leaving just Noibat to fall to two Crunches for the KO in the win, with some alternating Protect shenanigans to be safe. I'm just gonna say that Leftovers being this accessible in this game just makes Protect a way better move than it has any right to be. With them out of the way though, I'm able to head into the Mallee Garden, talk to Professor Kukui, and get him over to the next area of progression, but I've gotta grab a new encounter before leaving. Up in Mallee's outer cape, I can grab myself a Trubbish. Now, I'm not sure if Garboder will be a quality pure poison type, seeing as Arbok is filling that role quite nicely with that Intimidate ability, but we'll have to see later as I move to the top of Mount Hokulani for my trial against Sophocles and the Totem Togedemaru. Oddly enough, this one's very simple due to Togedemaru and the partner Skarmory being both steel types, seeing as now I have access to 50 totem stickers, and after collecting all 50 among the three available islands so far, I go to Hey Hey Beach, talk to Professor Oak's Alolan form, and get the totem Salazzle. Now this Salazzle doesn't actually get any benefits in terms of stats or power from being a totem Pokemon, it's just convenient that now I have access to a fire type before stead steel types. 
Now Salazzle just has to set up a nasty plot and KO easily from there with Flame Burst, despite it looking a little wonky since Togemaru having Spiky Shield, a grass type protect that does damage if I do a physical attack into it, and Zing Zap, a electric type move that can flinch. But since Skarmory has nothing to damage Salazzle with outside of a heavily resisted Steel Wing, it does not matter. Also, fun little synergy that occurs here is since Flame Burst does residual damage to ally Pokemon in double battles like this, I can break Skarmory Sturdy and next turn KO it after taking out Togemaru. Very neat. Well, with the Electrium Z in hand, I've got another trip to Mali Garden to make. Seeing as Guzma has finally revealed himself as the boss of Team Skull and I gotta go punch his bugs in the face a few times to proceed. He's actually hilariously easy though. Thanks to Tentacruel with Protect being able to block a potential first impression as well as Barrier, I can set up 2 plus 6 defense for his physical Glissopod, all while burning his power points for Sucker Punch, then just attacking with Poison Jab until depleting Glissopod to below half when Emergency Exit leads to Masquerade coming in. Of course, this guy's special base, so Barrier doesn't do anything against him, but it doesn't exactly matter when I can just alternate an attack with Protect to take him out, even through a critical air cutter that brings Tentacruel to red HP. A few Bubble Beams manages to grab that KO, leading back into Glissopod, who falls in a few turns to Poison Jab and the Poison status, winning me the first of three battles with him throughout the story. After a quick run through of routes 12 and 13, I'm able to make it into Tapu Village and talk to Acerola over in the Aether House to get her trial started straight away, since oh boy, I'm starting to get exhausted of Alola already. Too much talking, not enough battles to worry about. Then again, that might just be a byproduct of the Poison type doing the job of stall until the opponent dies way too well. Speaking of stressful battles though, I think the Totem Mimikyu is probably the most worrisome of them all since Welcome to Pokemon's version of th the Bastard featuring his tax shield. I start off with Arbok in order to get both Intimidate to lower attack and Bulldoze to lower speed, taking out the disguise during this opportunity, but that critical Shadow Claw was certainly an irritating shot to take. I use Protect to get back above half, seeing Will-O-Wisp from the partner Bayonet that was summoned to the field, but before I swap, I'm hitting this Mimikyu with Acid Spray. I'm likely to get KO'd if both of them attack, but Bayonet is probably going to go for Will-O-Wisp again, which Leftovers will heal first, so I think I'm in a good spot. Sure enough, I am. Though the burn never happened, seeing as Screech was the move of choice instead, thankfully hitting after Shadow Claw did. From here, I swap into Salazzle, but yeah, that didn't work since she took away too much of my health for me to even try attacking. So to Grimer we go, as Shadow Claw and Faint Attack do less than a third collectively after Leftovers healing. Not bad, I can use Protect and use Poison Fang on Mimikyu in the hopes to badly poison this sucker, but it doesn't work out as Bayonet sets up Curse, bringing Grimer to 7 HP and putting me in a rougher spot. My best hope now is to go to Tentacruel, stalling with Barrier. Thankfully, that ends up working for a short period of time as Bayonet misses the first Will-O-Wisp and the second is blocked by Protect as the second Barrier gets set up, but the third attempt at Will-O-Wisp does manage to land. Yeah, this isn't going to work out for long now. I gotta hit Poison Jab on Mimikyu to poison it, and this works, but this only burns the Lumberry. I have to poison it twice for this to even work. Second shot doesn't get the poison though, so Tentacruel's just about out of gas. I have two Pokemon left with full HP, first of those is Crobat, so I swap it in, barely take any damage on said swap as I use Protect to heal a bit, then use Cross Poison on Mimikyu for some more attempted poisoning. But that fails, so I go for it one more time, failing yet again as Play Rough and Screech ends up hitting Crobat. Well then, I'm using another Protect to restrain a few more power points. And you know what? Screw it, I'm using Cross Poison to hopefully get this poisoning, even if Crobat goes down, but... Thankfully, I'm saved yet again due to Bayonet being an idiot and going for Screech again. The poison manages to bring down Mimikyu though, as I swap into Gengar, my last full HP Mon, sniping down Bayonet with a Shadow Ball for a well-fought victory that required a few too many risks for my blood. Mimikyu was definitely a busted Pokemon back in Generation 7. Disguise is probably the nastiest ability I've ever seen in my life, thank you for nerfing it. However, we're just about done here. Four more battles to take down, three of which are Team Skull-related shenanigans, so let's take them out of commission first. Plumeri is a quick takedown, with Golbat falling to a plus four flamethrower from Salazzle, but it's not enough for her own Salazzle, since I don't have anything that's even neutral here, swapping to my newly evolved Muck and taking her out quickly with Crunch. Second up is the battle against Guzma at the head of Po Town, so I solid snake my way up to the shady house, using the intelligence provided by Otacon to have the passwords needed to get to Guzma, without even needing to get them from the grunts. <sighs> Colonel, I'm trying to sneak around, but the clap of Salazzle's ass cheeks keeps alerting the grunts. 
This battle is similar to the last one where I can use Tentacruel for the majority of it, but three Pokemon is a little bit harder to take down than two, because simple math. Once I managed to set up my three barriers through his five power points of Sucker Punch, as well as using it a fourth time to evade the fifth and final attack, I'm able to use two Venishocks to get Galissapod into yellow HP, causing Emergency Exit to trigger into Pinsir rather than Masquerain, so this might still be soloable with Tentacruel. This is just an alternating contest of Protect and my attack of choosing, eventually using two Venishocks and a Brine once Pinsir is below half HP to KO through Throat Chops. Actually, come to think of it, where the hell is Tentacruel's throat? I, I don't even know how you chop something like that. I guess it's just tentacle chop. Anyway, Masquerade's in next, which is a little unfortunate. I was hoping he would bring in Galissapod for Tentacruel to finish off due to being that a physical attacker who can't yield any damage. But that's fine. I'm one point away from full HP, and I'm able to take it out here. Two Venishox, Protect, and Brine manages to do so, leaving just that Galissapod with Tentacruel right around the same HP, alternating Venishock and Protect twice more to get the KO and chase them out of town, with the bug in EMC gotten along the way. Well then, with him gone, I'm able to talk to Nanu, run back to the Aether House, and discover that, oh boy, Lily's been kidnapped. Well, shoulda left that Cosmog with somebody who could actually beat the asses of people who tried to steal the nearly useless thing. Well, that means I just gotta fight Gladian, as he's pissed about the whole thing and probably thinking the same thing I am, with him leading Gulbat against my Arbok, who intimidates him and uses Crunch for a third, as Acrobatics does a bit of damage, but not a whole bunch to where I can actively use Arbok to KO here instead of swapping it in over and over again for Intimidate, using Protect to heal just enough and survive the third Acrobatics, taking him out with three Crunches. Second out is Type Null who I use Protect and swap into Tentacruel, using Protect here again to heal off some of that Hyper Voice, which alerts me to this being Zoroark instead. So I just go for Brian to KO in three shots, alternating with Protect, which leaves the real Type Null. This thing is a bastard, and with how powerful Crush Claw is, I need to set up barriers, dodging the first Crush Claw, but taking some decent damage from the second, alternating Protect and Brian until a few defense drops causes me to set up another barrier, but these are getting to be too much. I gotta swap over to Muck. Of course, Crush Claw does slightly less than half but gets the defense drop again, so I gotta protect my way out of this, and I don't even think that Muck will be able to survive a second one if it's a high roll, and I don't want to risk that, so I swap into Crobat, taking a resisted pursuit in the process, which might be the best thing that could have happened to Crobat, since now it doesn't have to take a Crush Claw. Cross Poison does a whole lot of nothing, but I'm starting to realize he's out of Crush Claws, so it doesn't even matter. I just use three of them, KOing and ending the battle. Alright, with the Skullheads out of here, it's time for Nanu and his Band of Dark Dumbasses. Thankfully, his level cap is 44, the perfect cap for me to get Flamethrower on Salazzle, so we should be in good hands in terms of damage output, though I've got to see how I can set up effectively seeing as his lead Sableye and his Persian have Power Gem. I think my best hope is to just PowerPoint stall him out of the game, but Shadow Ball with his lead Sableye does a bit of damage, so Tentacruel's out pretty quick as I swap into Muck to start draining Power Gem, but Nanu is the first intelligent trainer in the game, swapping into Krokorok after I go into Muck in order to use Earthquake. Well then, good thing I still have Crobat. Although it's quite frustrating to see him go for Swagger on the turn that I expect Earthquake, I swap back into Muck to take a crunch, protect against an Earthquake, then swap into Crobat, expecting Earthquake this time, in which he uses Swagger again. What the f***, dude? <laughs> Why are you reading my inputs? I just have to drain Earthquake here or I lose, so you are making this task harder than it should be. Thankfully on the third switch in of Crobat, he finally goes for Earthquake, but I have the glorious idea of just knocking out the bastard with Aerial Ace, leading to Sableye at half HP once more, whom I swap into Muck and take a Power Gem, Protect, and Gunk Shot to nearly KO as Power Gem hits again. Well, this is either a full restore or another Power Gem, so I predict the latter and go for Protect to get some more healing, and yeah, he has zero healing items, so I take him down next turn with Crunch. Alrighty. All that's left is Persian, and I've just gotta make it through this Z-move, and from there we should be in the clear. And Protect here does give me the best shot, but instead it chooses to not attack with the Dark and EMZ. So I just go for Gunk Shot next turn, getting the poison on Persian and forcing him into a full heal, I guess he has those, but not actually healing items, using Venom Drench to try to lower his attacking stats that turn, but failing because the item has priority. Well then, I guess just protect a few times more and poison should do it, no Z-move protection required. And that's 3 out of 4 Grand Trials. Unfortunately, I don't get to go to Pawnee Island just yet though, I've got to take care of more story bastards that are blocking my progression. 
Faba of the Aether Foundation holds no struggle here despite fighting me twice, so honestly, all I gotta worry about is the last fight against Guzma and the one against Lusamine in here. Guzma is once again not at all bad because of Tenacruel being the perfect wall against Galissapod. Protect, barrier, 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 useless barrier to drain that last power point of Sucker Punch, Venishock, protect, Brine, protect, Brine, protect, and a critical Venishock, which actually is pretty good timing since this gets Galissapod into the red, triggering emergency exit as fast as possible with the most damage, and the horrible looking bug is finally gone, leading to Vicavolt. Well then, this is not exactly the new addition to the team that Tentacruel would be good at fighting against, so I swap into Muck, taking Thunderbolt for less than half, protecting, and then using Gunk Shot, allowing me to repeat that process in order to grab the KO, leading to Pinsir third. Makes sense that he's going for this here, seeing as he has the most neutral attacks for Muck here since it's part Dark type, but that's where his downfall lies. See, those which are neutral on Muck are resisted by the rest of my team, namely Arbok, who's able to intimidate Spam so hard, allowing for me to set up a grand total of three Intimidates before finally swapping back into Tentacruel and setting up barriers again, just starting to wail on him afterwards. Unfortunately, the only backfire of this plan isn't really a backfire, it's just an oversight, and that's Storm Throw. See, this move always crits and gets through both Barrier and the attack drops from Intimidate, but he's dumb and doesn't always go for it, so I can still cheese him with Tentacruel, getting up to full HP by the time Masquerade comes out. And you know this story from here. Except the story is different, no longer is it Air Cutter, rather it's Air Slash managing to flinch Tentacruel twice in a row, so I can't actually finish off Masquerade from here. I think the best course of action is to swap into Muck, Protect, then swap into Crobat since now I'm baiting Bug Buzz, and then Protect for the HP gain and Aerial Ace for the KO. Perfect. Last out is the red HP Galissapod, but I'm not risking first impression, so I Protect, then KO with Aerial Ace for the win. Like I said earlier in the video, Poison types are really good at slowly wearing down the opponent, but sometimes that leads to really boring fights. With him done and the recon squad done and away with as well, it's time for Lusamine and her band of numbnuts. I pushed my Pokemon as close to the level cap as I could conceivably get away with, bringing them all up to at least level 47 before this fight begins, and that was a really good choice seeing as Lusamine's team is actually solid due to not being a band of monotype goons. Then again, I'm using monotype goons and kicking her ass, so she should probably do them a whole monotype thing. <laughs> anyway, she leads with Clefable as I go with Muck, and probably for the best since she's got Psychic on this, but that Moonblast still does massive damage despite being neutral. Though, Gunk Shot gets the one shot here, leading to Milotic. Now this gal has Hydro Pump, and that's a pretty strong move. So I go into Tentacruel expecting it, but get Dragon Pulse instead. Huh. This then just becomes a war of attrition of me just alternating Venishock and Protect in order to recover and beat back her attempts at damaging me with Icy Wind, Hydro Pump, and Dragon Pulse, and eventually working out relatively well. I even attempt to set up barriers in the effort to have some protection for some later Mons, though that was a little dependent on her missing with Hydro Pump more than she did. Oh well, I can just swap into Muck once those are done for, protecting and finishing off Milotic with a Gunk Shot. Two down, three to go as Beware comes in, and yeah, this is what I wanted Barrier for. This fucker is strong, like ridiculously strong in the physical department, so I'm gonna try to use Arbok to lower his attack, though even at minus one, takedown still does over half to Arbok, meaning that strategy is not going to work very well. I swap into Crobat in the hopes that she's going for a fighting move, which that does end up happening thanks to Drain Punch, but Fly, even at this HP, isn't able to grab the KO, barely missing it. Oddly enough though, she doesn't go for Zen Headbutt on the come down turn though, meaning I take a takedown for over half to spare, KOing with Cross Poison after some Protect and Recovery leading to Low Punny. Now this gal has all three elemental punches, so you turn into someone with good physical defense is my best bet, though I really don't have a physical tank at all. So I go into Arbok to get some attack reduction, survive Dizzy Punch on 19 HP, then after some leftovers recovery swap into Salazzle, thankfully on a Fire Punch. This is a pretty easy setup from here though, as while she's trying to attack, I'm able to set up a few nasty plots. Though of course Dizzy Punch has to get the confusion. Please lady, I'm trying to end the battle, it's been two minutes of video by this point, get off my screen. Since I'm pretty tilted at the confusion luck here, I just stay in with Salazzle and keep clicking flamethrower so that the battle ends as fast as possible, but that is a stupid idea. Thankfully, <laughs> Lusamine proves to be an even more eternal moron than myself by using Ice Punch and allowing Salazzle to pick up the KO with a flamethrower, staying confused for her last Pokemon Lilligan, but KOing that as well since I'm a stubborn idiot. Throwing for content, but instead just winning fast, that's what we live for, baby!
Alright, finally, one more island to go and there's not much here for me. That's probably because there's more Aether and Necrozma stupidity to deal with, but we're just gonna forget about that for now. For now, we have to do a few small things, namely getting the Moon Flute from Executor Island, so that we can call upon Lunala to stop Lusamine from going absolutely insane, though we've got a Totem Komoo to take down first. I'm leading Gengar here, since I don't want to finish this as fast as possible, and I know I can survive a non-crit Dragon Claw and nail a massive Psychic. But that Psychic actually does a ton less than I expected, not even half, so I swapped Arbok as Scizor gets called in, and you know what that means? Intimidate Spam, Intimidate Spam, send an Arbok, Intimidate Spam. Actually, it's not as much as you'd think. Seeing as Crobat can easily plow through Como after Intimidate with Fly, as Scizor just keeps using Bullet Punch, doing light damage and allowing for me to get through Como with two Flies, leaving just Scizor. I recover just enough to U-turn out of here after a Bullet Punch, going into Salazzle and KOing with a Quad Effective Flamethrower for the quick win. And that wasn't too bad. Thankfully, he's the second to last Totem Pokemon we'll have to take on, and after one HELL OF A FRUSTRATING TIME TRYING TO GET INTO THE ULTRA MEGAPOLIS. Seriously, I absolutely hate using an emulator for this portion of the game, seeing as the gyro controls are just not that well mapped for something like a mouse. So I'm able to travel up and fight Ultra Necrozma, somehow not losing a SINGLE Pokémon to this beast, despite it being a notorious run killer, and now I was kinda close! Thank you, Muck, for being our only saving grace and for Toxic Poison easily outing a wild Pokémon, leaving the few battles I've got to complete to get the last Totem Pokemon under my belt. However, I've got to get a quick gift first. I'm able to get a gift Hoi Pole beforehand, which is the only Ultra Beast I'll have access to for this run. I actually forgot to mention it in the intro since I completely forgot this was here, but you know what? I'm pretty happy with this. Dragalge was originally going to be my dragon type of choice, but now I've got a completely superior one, especially with Beast Boost. Sadly, it evolves upon knowing Dragon Pulse, which is a move we don't have access to through Move Tutor since it's over on Pawnee Island's Battle Tree, a post-game area, and the Move Relitter is on the top of Mount Lanakila, the home of the Pokemon League, so it's staying boxed until then. Anyway, I'd love to talk about these fights before the final totem. All of them are rather challenging. Mina, Ilima, Lana, Kyawe, all of them have a little bit of challenge to them, but nothing is crazy here. And neither is the totem Rabambi. After all, it's just this game's two-stage bug type, akin to a Combi Vespaquen or a Carablast Escavalier. Definitely weak for this point in the game, and pretty easily outable by two of Muck's gunk shots. Now all that's left is the mandatory rival battle before the League, or in this case, Gladian. He's kind of a rival, but he's been mostly Team Skull. This fight's rather simple, as I can just intimidate spam on Crobat over and over and over and over and over and over again, until I physically can't send in Arbok anymore without it getting KO'd. Finally bringing in Salazzle and setting up three nasty plots in order to KO Crobat with Flamethrower, Zoroark masking as Lucario with Flamethrower. I knew it wasn't Lucario, but why take the risk if the computer opponents are reading my inputs? Silvali with Sludge Wave, and the real Lucario with Flamethrower for the quick win. Guess that's what happens when you have exactly acrobatics and cross poison with no other support moves on your crowbat there, buddy. Try filling up all your move slots next time, and maybe you wouldn't suck so much dick. Speaking of dick, with the edging to the top of level 57 complete, it's time for the Elite Four, and hopefully the champion, assuming we make it that far. Of course, complete with preparations like PowerPoint ups from the totally legitimate Mantine surfing I've been doing, and TMs from every part of the region I can get my hands on. Except for stuff like Dark Pulse and Surf. I really wanted those moves, but they're locked behind the post game. So was Waterfall, which I was originally going to put on Tentacruel, but because I can't, I'm leaving it behind. Do you think I'm gonna make it through, or am I gonna choke at the very end? Leave your predictions in the comments, and then in the meantime, I'm gonna kick so much ass fast enough to where you won't be able to finish said predictions by the time I've won. First up, I've chosen Kahili, the flying type user, leading Naganadal against her Braviary, using Charm as she goes for Scary Face, and swapping into Arbok upon Brave Bird's use, taking less than half, with Leftovers Recovery bringing me back over two thirds. I try setting up Coil here in order to try a potential Poison Jab sweep with Arbok, but Air Slash just seems to be cutting me off from that. I'd love to continue after KOing Braviary in one shot, but Mandibuzz totally outspeeds after two scary faces connect, so I swap into Muck on a Punishment for very minimal damage, getting flattered into Confusion and hitting myself before swapping for Crobat on a Brave Bird. 
Leftovers recovery gets me a little bit back as U-turn does around a quarter, with flatter being used on my newly swapped muck again, so I just repeat that process of going back in a crowbat, using U-turn, and being flattered by Mandibuzz before finally hitting a gunk shot for the KO through confusion, leading to Hawlucha. Of course, he's gonna go for that flying press here due to the partial dark typing, so I swap into Gengar, thanks to immunity I'm able to take it scot-free, then swap back into Muck due to Throat Chop, a dark type move that would be super effective, but resisted by Muck. From here, I could just PowerPoint stall him out of the game until Dual Chop and Poison Jab become his only available moves, though I do lose track of how much is left. Not that it matters, because I finally bring in Salazzle, get off two nasty plots before sweeping it with Flamethrower, KOing Halucha, two cannon, and Oricorio, the latter with Sludge Wave since it was the fire type variant, giving me my first win. Also, in case you think turning on the experience share at this point in the game is pretty cheap, the champion title defense against Hao has a Primarina at level 60, so I don't feel bad about my Pokemon getting to that level beforehand. Next up, I'm choosing Acerola for my second fight, seeing as I have a little bit of a level advantage now, perfect for Naginatal to alternate three charms and protects on Bayonet to lower his attack to minus six, setting up three nasty plots afterwards, alternating with protect once again, eventually finishing off the chain with Dragon Pulse. Yeah, now this fight's pretty trivial, as Dragon Pulse one-shots Bayonet, Frostlass, who oddly enough doesn't always go for Ice Shard here, only using it on my Protect turn, which is appreciated. Palisand, Delmise, and Drifblim. Thank you for not using Mimikyu, I would have had to use Salazzle for this sweep instead. Third up is Olivia, the last of the physical attack users, so I'm leading with Naginatal again to use three charms, and sweep with Nasty Plot and Dragon Pulse. But after taking out her lead Armaldo, Probopass comes in, and that plan is pretty much null and void thanks to Thunder Wave. Even at plus six, I'm only doing half with Dragon Pulse. That's how sky high of defense this Probopass has. So this ends up being a stall fest with me trying to use Muck and Fire Punch to do damage, but of course a full restore resets my progress. From here I try swapping into Crobat and getting that immunity from Earth Power, then using U-Turn on a non-Earth Power turn to go back into Muck to bait it again, but I'm still not doing enough damage here. This gets Muck to the point where he's at low HP and paralyzed, basically unusable for the rest of the fight. So I swap into Crobat once again to use Protect, letting the Sandstorm subside and U-Turn for minimal damage to bring back in Naginatal to take the attempted Thunder Wave, being essentially negated thanks to it already being paralyzed, then seeing Sandstorm set up on the swap in turn, then do the same thing two more times to prevent Crobat from being paralyzed, KOing with U-Turn and going into Salazzle, which baits her Gigalith. Of course, I can't stay in with a fire type on Gigalith, but what I can do is alternate between Crobat and Arbok to drain this guy of Stone Edge power points, not get hit by Bulldoze, and lower his attack all at the same time to attempt a late game sweep with Salazzle once he's down to his last two moves. And the power point depletion works pretty well, eventually seeing Iron Head being busted out once all five Stone Edge points are depleted, but there are a few more Bulldoze points I gotta worry about. I almost wish it was the more powerful Earthquake, only so that I'd have to deal with only 10 of them instead of Bulldoze's more than 10. This continues until I get him down to minus 6, overshooting with an accidental 7th switch in, but it's fine. I can just use Coil with Arbok and get to plus 6 with attack, defense, and accuracy. But that's a little cocky. I finally get hit with a critical hit that comes from Bulldoze and KOs Arbok. Well. Good thing you're the last person to use physical attacks as your uh, your primary win condition. From here, I just go into Salazzle, set up Nasty Plot, and sweep the remainder of her team with Sludge Wave and Flamethrower, pulling down Gigalith, Grace, Lycanroc, and Cradilly to win the match. Well then, having only five Pokemon for two more fights might be a little bit worrisome, though Arbok is probably the most expendable member at this point because of Olivia being the last person to use physical attackers as her main game plan. Last up in the league is Mulane, replacing Hala and having a pretty easy team to hout, all things considered. After all, he uses Steel types. How hard can this be? Well, his lead is a clef key with Prankster and Thunder Wave, meaning I can't really do anything with Salazzle unless I want to get paralyzed. So I use Gengar as a lead to use Hypnosis, then put him to sleep the swap in and use exactly one nasty plot, since that's all Salazzle needs to sweep this team. Sadly, he wakes up but happily, he misses with Thunder Wave, allowing my strategy to remain intact and blast Klefki, Dugtrio, Metagross, Magnezone through Sturdy after surviving a Thunderbolt, and Bisharp all with Flamethrower to win the battle. Alright, that was a bit of a worry thanks to that Thunder Wave, 
but all I've got left is the champion, and I just need one Pokemon to survive to win, so I am going for this. How leads with Raichu here, and since it's the Alolan variant with the partial psychic typing, I go with Gengar, an automatic outspeeding one shot with Shadow Ball as Tauros is second, putting me in the perfect 5 on 5 scenario. Now my Gengar doesn't have Levitate, so I'm kind of stuck draining Tauros' power points with Gengar and Crobat to avoid Double Edge, but Crobat still takes quite a bit of damage from Zen Headbutt. This leads me to swap into Muck on an Earthquake turn though, whoopsie, because he's willing to alternate between Earthquake and Zen Headbutt to the point where I can't accurately predict which one's coming, especially because Gengar without Levitate kind of makes this almost impossible to drain both potentially super effective moves. Thankfully though, I can just take advantage of this by swapping between Crobat and Gengar once again, sacking Muck to an Earthquake so I can bring in Naginatal, use Nasty Plot, survive an Earthquake, then KO with Dragon Pulse. I know that it would survive at least one, then Beast Boost triggers to get me to plus three special attack, with Crabominable coming in and going down immediately to Dragon Pulse to bring me to plus four. What I didn't account for though, is that Noivern is a fast son of a bitch. Well then, see you later Naginatal, I'm in a pretty tough spot now. I go into Gengar here, but even Gengar is outsped and Dark Pulsed, with Hypnosis unfortunately missing, so Gengar goes down here too. Well, I'm even in a tougher spot, I have two Pokemon left, so I go into Crobat, taking Dragon Pulse and hitting Cross Poison for some damage, but then getting KO'd. Okay, I'll have a Salazzle against three Pokemon, but I know I can survive at least one attack, so I Nasty Plot and hope for the best, outspeeding and KOing with Sludge Wave. Okay. Outspeeding, this means I outspeed the rest of the team, so I should be fine as long as everything's one shot. It's still one on two, but Primarina's out next, thankfully with that additional fairy typing making Sludge Wave a pretty sweet and easy KO, and fortunately I don't make the mistake of using Protect and accidentally getting hit with Hydro Vortex. This leaves just Flareon, and this should not be able to do enough damage to me here, but I do Protect to heal just in case off of Leftovers, with Quick Attack being on his moveset, but then he doesn't go for it. I use Sludge Wave next turn, get the KO, and the win, with one Pokemon left standing. That championship fight, holy moly, I did not expect for that to be so tense. I had no idea Noivern was so speedy, probably because I've never used one before. Pokemon that I haven't used between generations six and eight end up being a little bit of a faltering point for me in these runs because I'm not familiar with their stats, and honestly I wouldn't expect Noivern to be the speediest fucker out there, but turns out it is. It's pretty cool. I'm glad I clutched it out at the end with Salazzle though, it's probably the best ending I could have asked for. The game with so many totem Pokemon as enemies finally led me to victory thanks to one of their own. Pretty poetic if I say so myself. With that though, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this challenge, and if you did, please do leave suggestions for other challenges in the comments. I do read them and try to respond as much as possible. And if you want to see more, subscribe and follow me on Twitter, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video. They're the best ways of seeing my content when it releases. Anyway, stay safe, stay healthy, I'll see you next time.